The traveling salesman crisscrossed Nebraska and Iowa tirelessly under the burning sun in that summer of 1955. He sat behind the wheel of a 53 Mercury sedan that already had better than 70,000 miles on it. The Merc was developing a marked wheeze in the valves. He was a big man who still had the look of a corn-fed Midwestern boy on him. In that summer of 1955, only four months after his Omaha house painting business had gone broke, Greg Stilson was only 22 years old. The trunk and the back seat of the Mercury were filled with cartons, and the cartons were filled with books. Most of them were Bibles. They came in all shapes and sizes. There was your basic item, the American Truthway Bible, illustrated with 16 color plates bound with airplane glue for $1.69, and sure to hold together for at least 10 months. Then for the poorer pocketbook, there was the American Truthway New Testament for 65 cents, with no color plates, but with the words of Our Lord Jesus printed in red. And for the big spender, there was the American Truthway Deluxe Word of God for $19.95, bound in imitation white leather, the owner's name to be stenciled in gold leaf on the front cover, 24 color plates, and a section in the middle to note down births, marriages, and burials. And the deluxe word of God might remain in one piece for as long as two years. There was also a carton of paperbacks entitled, America the Truth Way, the Communist Jewish Conspiracy Against Our United States. Greg did better with this paperback printed on cheap pulp stock than with all the Bibles put together. It told all about how the Rothschilds and the Roosevelts and the Greenblatts were taking over the U.S. economy and the U.S. government. There were graphs showing how the Jews related directly to the communist, Marxist, Leninist, Trotskyite axis, and from there to the Antichrist itself. The days of McCarthyism were not long over in Washington. In the Midwest, Joe McCarthy's star had not yet set, and Margaret Chase Smith of Maine was known as that bitch for her famous declaration of conscience. In addition to the stuff about communism, Greg Stilson's rural farm constituency seemed to have a morbid interest in the idea that the Jews were running the world. Now Greg turned into the dusty driveway of a farmhouse some 20 miles west of Ames, Iowa. It had a deserted, shut-up look to it, the shades down and the barn doors closed, but you could never tell until you tried. That motto had served Greg Stilson well in the two years or so since he and his mother had moved up to Omaha from Oklahoma. The house painting business had been no great shakes, but he had needed to get the taste of Jesus out of his mouth for a little while. You should pardon the small blasphemy. But now he had come back home. Not on the pulpit or revival side this time, though. And it was something of a relief to be out of the miracle business at last. He opened the car door, and as he stepped out into the dust of the driveway, a big, mean farm dog advanced out of the barn, its ears laid back. It volleyed barks. Hello, pooch, Greg said in his low, pleasant, but caring voice. At 22, it was already the voice of a trained spellbinder. The pooch didn't respond to the friendliness in his voice. It kept coming big and mean, intent on an early lunch of traveling salesmen. Greg sat back down in the car, closed the door, and honked the horn twice. Sweat rolled down his face and turned his white linen suit darker gray in circular patches under his arms, and in a branching tree shape up his back. He honked again, but there was no response. The clodhoppers had loaded themselves into their international harvester or their Studebaker and gone into town. Greg smiled. Instead of shifting into reverse and backing out of the driveway, he reached behind him and produced a flit gun. Only this one was loaded with ammonia instead of flit. Pulling back the plunger, Greg stepped out of the car again, smiling easily. The dog, which had settled down on its haunches, immediately got up again and began to advance on him, growling. Greg kept smiling. That's right, Poochie, he said in that pleasant, caring voice. You just come on, come on and get it. He hated these ugly farm dogs that ran their half acre of dooryard like arrogant little Caesars. They told you something about their masters as well. Fucking bunch of clodhoppers he said under his breath. He was still smiling. Come on, doggy. The dog came. It tensed its haunches down to spring at him. In the barn, a cow mooed, 
and the wind rustled tenderly through the corn. As it leaped, Greg's smile turned to a hard and bitter grimace. He depressed the flit plunger and sprayed a stinging cloud of ammonia droplets directly into the dog's eyes and nose. Its angry barking turned immediately to short, agonized yips, and then, as the bite of ammonia really settled in, to howls of pain. It turned tail at once, a watchdog no longer, but only a vanquished cur. Greg Stilson's face had darkened. His eyes had drawn down to ugly slits. He stepped forward rapidly and administered a whistling kick to the dog's haunches with one of his stride king air tip shoes. The dog gave a high wailing sound, and driven by its pain and fear, it sealed its own doom by turning around to give battle to the author of its misery, rather than running for the barn. With a snarl, it struck out blindly, snagging the right cuff of Greg's white linen pants and tore it. You son of a bitch, he cried out in startled anger, and kicked the dog again, this time hard enough to send it rolling in the dust. He advanced on the dog once more, kicking it again, still yelling. Now the dog, eyes watering, nose in fiery agony, one rib broken and another badly sprung, realized its danger from this madman, but it was too late. Greg Stilson chased it across the dusty farmyard, panting and shouting, sweat rolling down his cheeks, and kicked the dog until it was screaming and barely able to drag itself along through the dust. It was bleeding in half a dozen places. It was dying. Shouldn't have bit me, Greg whispered. You hear? You hear me? You shouldn't have bit me, you dipshit dog. No one gets in my way. You hear? No one. He delivered another kick with one blood-spattered air tip, but the dog could do no more than make a low, choking sound. Not much satisfaction in that. Greg's head ached. It was the sun, chasing the dog around in the hot sun. Be lucky not to pass out. He closed his eyes for a moment, breathing rapidly, the sweat rolling down his face like tears and nestling in his crew cut like gems, the broken dog dying at his feet. Colored specks of light pulsing in rhythm with his heartbeat floated across the darkness behind his lids. His head ached. Sometimes he wondered if he was going crazy, like now. He had meant to give the dog a burst from the ammonia flit gun, drive it back into the barn so he could leave his business card in the crack of the screen door, come back some other time and make a sale. Now look. Look at this mess. Couldn't very well leave his card now, could he? He opened his eyes. The dog laid his feet, panting rapidly, drizzling blood from its snout. As Greg Stilson looked down, it licked his shoe humbly, as if to acknowledge that it had been bested, and then it went back to the business of dying. Shouldn't have torn my pants, he said to it. Pants cost me five bucks, you shit poke dog. He had to get out of here. Wouldn't do him any good if Clem could diddle hopper and his wife and their six kids came back from town now in their Studebaker and saw Fido dying out here with the bad old salesman standing over him. He'd lose his job. The American Truthway Company didn't hire salesmen who killed dogs that belonged to Christians. Giggling nervously, Greg went back to the Mercury, got in, and backed rapidly out of the driveway. He turned east on the dirt road that ran straight as a string through the corn and was soon cruising along at 65, leaving a dust plume two miles long behind him. He most assuredly didn't want to lose the job, not yet. He was making good money. In addition to the wrinkles the American Truthway Company knew about, Greg had added a few of his own that they didn't know about. He was making it now. Besides, traveling around, he got to meet a lot of people, a lot of girls. It was a good life, except, except he wasn't content. He drove on, his head throbbing. No, he just wasn't content. He felt that he was meant for bigger things than driving around the Midwest and selling Bibles and doctoring the commission forms in order to make an extra two bucks a day. He felt that he was meant for, for, for greatness. Yes, that was it. That was surely it. A few weeks ago, he had taken some girl up in the hayloft. Her folks had been in Davenport selling a truckload of chickens. She had started off by asking if he would like a glass of lemonade. And one thing had just led to another. And after he'd had her, she said it was almost like getting diddled by a preacher. 
and he had slapped her. He didn't know why. He had slapped her and then left. Well, no. Actually, he had slapped her three or four times until she had cried and screamed for someone to come and help her, and then he had stopped, and somehow, he had had to use every ounce of the charm God had given him, he had made it up with her. His head had been aching then, too. The pulsing specks of brightness shooting and caroming across his field of vision, and he had tried to tell himself it was the heat, the explosive heat in the hayloft, but it wasn't just the heat that made his head ache. It was the same thing he had felt in the dooryard when the dog tore his pants, something dark and crazy. I'm not crazy, he said aloud in the car. He unrolled the window swiftly, letting in summer heat and the smell of dust and corn and manure. He turned on the radio loud and caught a Patty Page song. His headache went back a little bit. It was all a matter of keeping yourself under control and, and keeping your record clean. If you did those things, they couldn't touch you. And he was getting better at both of those things. He no longer had the dreams about his father so often. The dreams where his father was standing above him with his hard hat cocked back on his head, bellowing, You're no good, runt. You're no fucking good. He didn't have the dreams so much because they just weren't true. He wasn't a runt anymore. Okay, he had been sick a lot as a kid, not much size. But he'd gotten his growth. He was taking care of his mother, and his father was dead. His father couldn't see. He couldn't make his father eat his words because he had died in an oil derrick blowout, and he was dead. And once, just once, Greg would like to dig him up and scream into his moldering face, you were wrong, dad, you were wrong about me, and then give him a good kick the way, the way he had kicked the dog. The headache was back, lowering. I'm not crazy, he said again below the sound of the music. His mother had told him often that he was meant for something big, something great, and Greg believed it. It was just a matter of getting things, like slapping the girl or kicking the dog, under control and keeping his record clean. Whatever his greatness was, he would know it when it came to him. Of that, he felt quite sure. He thought of the dog again, and this time... The thought brought a bare crescent of a smile, without humor or compassion. His greatness was on the way. It might still be years ahead. He was young, sure. Nothing wrong with being young, as long as you understood you couldn't have everything all at once, as long as you believed it would come eventually. He did believe that. And God and Sonny Jesus help anyone that got in his way. Greg Stilson cocked a sunburned elbow out the window and began to whistle along with the radio. He stepped on the go pedal, walked that old Mercury up to 70, and rolled down the straight Iowa farm road toward whatever future there might be. 